Now I'm really excited to turn the conversation over for an amazing panel of entrepreneurs who are doing this every day um, to hear about what their experience is as, as they think about the 50 plus entrepreneurship journey and their perspective during this critical time. So it's my pleasure to turn the conversation uh, to Felicia Brown, who's really been an anchor and the spirit behind this project and, and driving us all to do better to moderate this panel. So with that, uh, over to you, Felicia. Thank you, Rhett. And thank you for um, that uh, enriching conversation that we just had with uh, John and Nancy. So thank you again for that. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited for this next panel, which really brings together some amazing entrepreneurs and small business owners. Uh, two of our business owners actually participated in the interviews that I highlighted and mentioned earlier um, today uh, that was launched by AARP. So we asked them to join us today to really share their perspective from what's happening on the ground and really some thoughts on systemic issues or challenges they've witnessed over the years and really more recently as a, uh, as a, as a as um, we've been in, involved in this pandemic. So without further, further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our next panel. First, I have Jaime Fuentes. He is the CEO of Jaime, I'm getting this mixed up, Fuentes Insurance Agency, Inc., located in Livingston, California. He was born in Mexico and immigrated to the United States in 1980 at the age of 14. He is a 2016 alumni of the Stanford Latino Entrepreneur Leaders Program. And next I have with me, I have Jan E. Lowe. She is the managing partner of CETE, Thai Bistro and Bar in Las Vegas, Nevada. For 12 years, she held strategic and senior level positions in human resources with Fortune 500 companies. With a passion to take the entrepreneur plunge, she opened her restaurant in 2005. She's a committed advocate for restauranteurs and, and, and women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Third, I have Kim Hunter. He is the CEO of Land Grant Communications. He's a key influencer in the communications industry. Provoke rest, recognized Hunter as an individual achievement for Sabre, superior achievement in branding, reputation, and engagement. He received that award and was na and named him as one of the Intu's Innovator 25. Kim has received other distinguished awards in public relations and most recently, PR Weeks, the most 50, the 50 most powerful people in PR award from 2012 to 2020. And last, we have Tawanda Livingston. She's the chief business strategist at Livingston Works. Tawanda Livingston is a successful and award-winning equity, diversity, and inclusion executive with almost 30 years of strategic and tactical experience. She's an innovative uh, thought equity, inclusion, and supplier diversity leader in this era. Prior to launching her business, she delivered transformational solutions for corporate and government agencies with the inclusion and supplier diversity space. So as you can see who we have with us today, we're gonna to have a very enriching conversation. So let's really dive in. So, you know, we can't say enough about um, how black and brown businesses were hit, especially hard during this pandemic. And Tawanda, I'd like to start with you as a small business owner Talk to us about the implication of the intersection between the pandemic and the social justice movement. Wanda? Thank you, Felicia. Um, that's a loaded question. And I have to say that what the pandemic and the social and civil crisis we experienced in America revealed to me was that we are all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. However, I do believe that if we tether our boats together, we can get to safe harbor so we can all eat well, live well, and play well. Now, there are brighter minds that are studying whether or not the tragedy with George Floyd and the intersection of the pandemic, if they happen at different times, would have had been differently. Again, brighter minds. However, the pandemic did reveal to us fissures 
in our legal system, our political system, our educational system, and our health system, and dare I say, our economic system. And what happened was that the fissures then imploded and exploded all at the same time across our nation really exposing how small businesses, the most fragile of small businesses, the most underserved, the ones that serve that serve our communities uh, on the peripheral have been impacted. And these, let me just tell you, these issues that small business face, they were faced before COVID and the social and civil unrest, and they just became magnified now that we're in this crisis. Um, and it all it was it was all the perfect storm um, for us. And what I would say, because those systems became laid bare, they were laid raw. We saw how all of these systems that were supposed to save us actually imprisoned us. And when they shut down, it impacted us in such a way that economically devastated business. We saw businesses close. We saw people lose their jobs. We saw um, uh, bodegas that we needed in our communities where there are food deserts um, that were serving a, a, a population, providing nutrition to that area closed down. And what happened is that even though those things were going on, we saw a crushing, a crushing of what make America great, the crushing of America's hope. See, what people was became fed up with, with the pandemic and George Floyd and the civil and social unrest, it became so overwhelming, the weight, it began to crush us. And people start to do outcry related to it because of the crushing of what make America great, and that is our hope, the hope that's in America. And those individual businesses that have been stigmatized, marginalized, and dare I say rationalized out of our economy begin to speak up and re begin to show up and say, hey, we are your major employers. And we showed the world that we are the major employers. So what I would end with saying that the intersection of the social and civil unrest and the uh, pandemic, it crushed us, but it did not crush the entrepreneurial spirit that makes America great. And that is that small businesses, believe it or not, showed up in force. Some of us did close, um, but we did rally around what was important, um, and that is to save our communities, to save our nation and save jobs. Um, and we did that collectively together. But I don't want to undermine that the exposure of what the pandemic and social and civil unrest did will show that the systems, the laws, the programs that were put into place to help small businesses because they work in vacuums and silos were not connected enough did not connect culturally to the communities that it needed to to to, to really elevate and, and hold up um, during this time. It exposed an economic ladder that is unjust, unfair, and was not designed for brown and black and women people to thrive or climb. So um, that's, that's what I would end with in saying that um, the spirit of us is still there because we, believe it or not, entrepreneurs, we were built for a time such as this. And so some of us are gonna emerge, but I would ask that we emerge together because what the pandemic showed us is that we are mutually dependent on one another to thrive. Right. And that's what we're all here to do. Right. Is Absolutely. Uh, any uh, thoughts um, from our other panelists about um, uh, how this intersected and in, uh, created what we are, where we are today? Well, I have a flip side to that, and that is there has been some positive outcomes of a pandemic. And I'm probably a beneficiary of that because I specialize in crisis management and I have a background in healthcare. And I will tell you, 2020 was the best year of my 30 years running my agency. Okay. On the eve okay. of my 20, 30th anniversary, I closed the largest piece of business in the history of the firm. What was it? It was a COVID-19 
educating the African-American community in the state of California, as well as encouraging African-Americans to get vaccinated. So while that was a tragedy on one end, I was a beneficiary of a success of a pandemic. Um, so while there is always some doom and gloom, uh, my, my philosophy has always been, and it has been for the 30 years I've been running my first business, is that always be prepared for the worst outcome. And I think one of the things I always tell small businesses today, yesterday, and in the future, is that you've got to save money for that rainy day. You have got to put a strategy in place that is not going to be short term, but also long term. Yeah. So Jan E, so what do we say, um, you know, to what to Kim's point about the fact that, um, you know, some of the small businesses really were not in a position. You all, this panel here, have years of experience. You um, know what to do and how to do it and how to um, put money away for the rainy day. But you know, you think about some of these uh, businesses that um, were valuable to our community, but just were not in a position to thrive. What do you say to that? It's very good, very good question, Felicia. You know, as entrepreneurs, we're so used to doing things on our own, right? Especially for the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, it is truly not our culture to help, uh, to ask for help. So when we open up businesses, we're like, you know what? That's my passion. I love to cook. I love to do this. So I'm going to open it up, right? So we don't really empower ourselves. And I'm guilty too. I'll, I'll be very honest, right? Is that networking, the importance of looking to networking, the information, the resources, everything's out there. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to thank the SBA, you know, so grateful and, and our government. Yes, I know a lot of time business owners like government, leave us alone, let us do our job, right? But this time when true crisis came in, the first round of PPP, I'll tell you, Felicia, it was a nightmare. Remember a year ago, everyone, that everyone's not, you know, we don't know what's happening with COVID, but moreover, everybody's out there running to get toilet papers. I mean, my God, right? So as business owners, you know, I always say that, just treat this analogy as a toilet paper. If one store, one PP, one lender is not giving you that lending, guess what? Go to another bank, go to another resource, right? Just like, Pull the paper. We don't just sit there and wait for them to restock the next week, right? So we got to take our own entrepreneurship spirit and go find the resources and go get the help. And I so because I'll tell you, a lot of resources are out there. Yeah. Think, yeah. And I'm I, sorry, I, Felicia. I would, no, I would say, I would echo that. I, I think that many small business owners um, actually pivoted when they realized that they weren't um, going to receive that PPP um, lending. So, um, which, which yes, and, and I do, yeah, and I see on the chat a lot of questions about, you know, idle loans, I'm not, you know, interest rates, all that stuff. And I encourage all of you to please take a look at it because I know the round two PPP has been extended to end of May. So, and if you don't know, please contact me. I will give you my personal contact. You can contact me. Let's get the money to you. See, that's what we're here for. So, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, uh, Jaime. Um, how, tell us a little bit about how your years of experience really kind of better equipped you to navigate the small business space. And, and what has been some of the strengths that come from that experience, um, but also has conversely um, continues to surprise you? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, there's a lot of questions too, but I'll try to talk it. Uh, you know, all these years in business and coming from another country, it's not an excuse for me not to try, not to, to get into a business or, or give it all my all. But honestly, my, my worst thing was time management. I learned time management as I went on my business because at the beginning, uh, when I started the business, uh, I didn't want appointments. I didn't want a to-do list because I felt like they were controlling my time. And, and uh, I wanted to go fishing whenever I wanted to go fishing. Or when I go play golf, I wanted to be available for, for my personal stuff. But guess what? I don't even know how to play golf. So, so that was a good excuse for me to get out of the office. But now with those years of experience, now I use my time very productive. I plan, I love to-do lists, and I love appointments. So, so if you don't control that time and, and make it as productive as possible, you, you leave a lot of opportunities on the table. The other thing is execution. 
I, I used to plan so many plans and so many things, but never executed, and, I mean, most of them. So I spent energy and time and money, and that was just wasted. Now I plan something and I finish it. Regardless, regardless of the outcome, I mean, if I give it my all, I, did, I, I feel I did good. You know? But also, I need to ask for help. I wasn't asking for help. There's help out there. Great. The other thing is acceptation, you know. Accept the situation where we are. I'm not saying uh, resignation. I'm not saying stay home and cry, accept that you lost. No, get up in the morning, show up to your office and see what's available. And like they were saying, yeah, he got his best deal during this pandemic. We don't want anything bad to happen on people, of course, we don't. But there is opportunities, regardless of what's going on on the, on the economy, you still have to get up and, and, and use your resources, what's at hand. A lot of times I have a tunnel vision and there's the, there's resources next to me that I don't I don't see. The, the other thing is real quick is you say navigating. I learned how to file a flight plan. I just thought about that the other day. You know, a pilot, when it takes out of the air, they, they have to file a flight plan. What is the most important thing on a flight plan? Estimation. What other information is there on the flight plan? Terrain, weather. Is there is there an, alter, an alternate route? Is there an airport next to me if I have a, an emergency? PPP, SBA. So it's like a business on the air. So you said navigating, so you got me there. But, but we just have to get out, get up in the morning, ask for help. So I, I think what, you're, what you are echoing is what we indicated at the top of our, our, of our event here that you know, entrepreneurs are resilient and a no is not always a no. Um, and so there's an opportunity to turn the no into yes um, and really looking at um, different ways to stay afloat, but we know that um, even in this pandemic, many of our small businesses um, were unable to survive um, what they perhaps thought they could because this pandemic was something that we never uh, saw, have seen before. And so Tawanda, I, um, I, I asked like, so, you know, what, as an older entrepreneur um, and, and having many years of experience um, doing this, uh, being as a small business owner, what have you gleaned in terms of your resilience really quickly? What I would state that is the ones that, what I would state that from my standpoint and my vantage point is that in order to thrive, you of course need wisdom that comes with age. So I'm not saying older, but age, I'm not gonna claim older, um, but you also need to one, be able to ask for help and seek help. Uh, intentionally, and to also identify a mentor, sponsor, or ambassador, someone to push and pull you to that next level, um, and to help you to strategize about the next. What is your next? You always should have a next, and looking at an environmental influences to see how they may impact that next. Um, so that's that's what I would state that the w people who are winning are the people who were able to say, no, I'm not going to accept no. No, I'm not going down without a fight. I'm going to fight. Yeah, I'm going to slow down, but I'm not going to shut down um, because it's never um, okay to, to check out. And that's what we want small businesses to know that um, if you're out of business, collaborate with someone else. Collaboration is key. Getting a mentor is key. And then also, shed your ego and ask for help. Step out, of, step out of that box and really go for what you started with this dream and you will achieve it. Great, great, good advice, good advice. So, you know, um, in our conversations with small business owners, you know, many of them indicated that they were denied um, or it was very challenging, um, difficult to access funding, even with a solid banking relationship. And, you know, we talked about that earlier. So Jane E, you know, talk to us a little bit about some of your personal experience with financial institutions mm -hmm. and your experience during this pandemic, because we know that um, restaurants were gravely impacted. Um, and another loaded piece here is, you know, how can the systems, because, you know, we really want to talk about um, how we can improve the systems that support small business owners. 
how can these systems better serve businesses of color, um, mm -hmm. perhaps as public and private sectors to help them better understand? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Felicia. And you know, like Tawanda say, you know, for us, understand that we are not alone, right? We are not the only restaurant that's going through this trouble of not getting, applying, all that stuff, right? I'll share with you, Felicia, it was very frustrating, the first round of PPP. And again, it's no fault. Everyone's just kind of reacting, right? By giving credit to the SBA and, and our um, government is that they heard it loud and clear is frustrating and the second round of PPP is actually easier. But how do we get to our local community grassroots folks? I'll tell you, sometimes, you know, when I got my PPP, I was excited, but I pick up the phone, call 20 of my friends and family who owns restaurant and say, hey, did you get yours? If not, why not? Let me show you who I went through, what I did. And we just, it just went viral, right? In fact, I was just talking to someone yesterday about who's a sole proprietor. They're like, no, I don't have payroll. I don't, I don't qualify for that. I'm like, well, do you have Schedule C? They're like, yes. I, and I say, well, you do qualify, right? So a lot of folks don't know that they, they themselves are limited themselves out of this process, right? So my, my advice to everyone is, if you don't know the answer, go find it. And if you don't know, if, call somebody. If that person, one person doesn't know it, call another person. Use your network and connect. And out of this today, I'll tell you, I'm gonna be calling Kim uh, down after this co conference, right? To say, hey, Kim, I wanna know how did you do it, right? Because I want to be like you. Right, so I think if you can just walk away from this two hour of webinar, just pick a couple of contacts here and follow up and, and learn, I think uh, that would be, I think that's a one great thing to walk away with. Great. So Kim, I'm gonna uh, ask you um, as a build on to that, um, uh -huh. uh, from, a systemic, uh, from a systemic perspective, uh -huh. what could um, the public and private sectors have done better? Um, to serve um, uh, our small businesses to really kind of help them shore up the finances needed? Well, one of the, what I call critical components, which is endemic of these institutions is none of them are really small businesses. They may work for these institutions, but no one knows what Tawanda, Jaime, and Jane Lee and I do every day as a small business owner. And I'm always amazed when I, hear, when I see classes, whether it's USC or UCLA or Stanford, where they have these programs where they are talking about entrepreneurship. No one knows what it's like to be a parent unless you're a parent. No one knows what it's like to be an entrepreneur <laughs> unless you live and breathe being an entrepreneur. So part of it is actually having people like us in those programs or seeking some of our feedback of what needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, no one can teach you how to be an entrepreneur. You have to have tools in your toolkit. Aside from the drive, I always tell people understanding a balance sheet, an income statement, cash flow analysis, projections. Now, I tell people all the time having a business plan is your roadmap to success. And having that business plan as a fluid component, because at the end of the day, you need to learn to pivot because guess what? Crisis comes up. And if you're not prepared for that crisis, there's a dilemma. And I always tell people, I learned from one of my clients, preparation, preparation, preparation. And if you're not prepared, there will be a problem. I like to add what Jay Lee had said. It's funny because when we first were on a prep call last week, one of the first things I did, because I love you very much, Ellie, and I love your restaurant. I went to your website. What I did, I had some friends in Las Vegas. I sent an email to them and I said, I met this entrepreneur who runs this very successful restaurant. Please go and patronize her. Part of that is if we don't help each other and pull each other up, who will? Right. And so it's, it's, so what I think I hear is two things. It's, uh, it's lean on one another. Um, but I also think what I heard critically, which I hope we explore more in our later panel, is really making sure that the small business is included in these decision making. Um, I often hear that sometimes that um, government doesn't understand small business. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it's, it's ensuring that the voice of the user mm -hmm. is there. And so Jaime, I'm, I, I want to get you into this, uh, this particular question around, you know, from where you sit, where can our systems uh, be better? Um, just based on I your think, experience. 
if I go back to my airplane story, you cannot engineer parts for an airplane if you don't know the mechanics of the airplane. Any, anybody can make parts, even a machine. But like Kim was saying, if you don't run a business, you don't know a business. Okay. I'm not criticizing anybody or putting anybody down, but it's critical that if you're going to make parts for an airplane, you better know because that can be dangerous, very okay. dangerous. So, so, so this, this situation is the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might put an airplane, but I mean, we got people making decisions and again, not criticizing that they don't know anything about. Simple as that, and, and that's the real world. Right, right. That, you you, you uh, shared that sentiment uh, nicely. So we know that you know there are a lot of organizations, and this is a great um, opportunity to talk about you know who is uh, creating and working on behalf of uh, small businesses. And so there are a lot of organizations and programs working to create uh, what we call ecosystems, wraparound services that really support the success of the a small business owner as a whole. And so Kim, talk to us about how they're doing with that. Like what else really needs to happen? I know you shared um, that the voice of the entrepreneur needs to be present, but what else is there that needs to be needs to happen, Kim? Well, I think one, aside from those ecosystems that you, re you referenced, uh, Felicia, I, I wanted to dovetail what was said earlier um, about what we as entrepreneurs or small business owners need to do. One of the, your key components, aside from being a, having a mentor and a sponsor, which I am 100% supportive of, also having a very good lawyer and having a very good CPA. I always tell people, as a CEO for the last 30 years of my career, the most important person to my enterprises, and as you know, I'm running three separate small businesses, is my CFO, because he has a good understanding of forecasting. And when we get in a room, or now virtually get on Zoom, we talk about what needs to be done, not just for today, but three months down the road, four months down the road. So those ecosystems are not just those institutions that we talked about and referenced earlier. It's all about our institution. My CFO, my lawyer are very, very critical for whatever I do and do a check-in. And I will tell you, having a good understanding of the local um, institutions, whether it's the city, in my case, I'm, I'm headquartered in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, and the state of California. All three of those entities have small businesses as a reference. Your local chambers are an excellent source. The SBA are excellent sources. But at the end of the day, having all of those ecosystems at your beck and call or at your availability, is a good resource, but I, small businesses or just business people should not be dependent on those, but having them as resources. I mean, at the end of the day, I would rather talk to a Jay Lee, a Jaime and a Tawanda before I talk to any of them. Why? Because they live and breathe and they know my pain because it's a 24 seven. It is not you clock in and you clock out. Because when people come to me, Felicia, and say, Kim, I'm thinking about starting a business, I will guarantee Jaime, Tawanda, and Jane Lee did not go through the process of asking someone permission. We made a decision. We were going to start a business, and we did it. Great. So, Tawanda, I know that um, uh, in an interview that we held together, uh, that you actually work with women-owned businesses to help them uh, launch uh, pivot, swivel, as you uh, is, is one of your words, and um, and so talk to us about you know ecosystems and um, programs that are in place to help just the very um, audience that you uh, that you serve, particularly those who are just getting started. And I, I love that Kim has basically said you know equip yourself with um, you know educate yourself, understand what it takes to start a small business. But we also know that there are lots of organizations uh, uh, out there that are tasked with just doing that. So what do you say to these, um, these systems um, in place, Tawana? Well, I would state that there are, being in the industry that I'm in, which is the industry of supplier diversity, helping minority and women businesses gain access to public government and private sector contracting, my network 
affords me the ability to tap into these systems, such as the Small Business Development Center, the Women Business Development Center. You have SCORE, you have uh, the uh, National uh, Independent Business Owners, you have chain various chambers, ethnic and gender-based chambers, if you feel, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, and also, you don't forget your Department of Chamber of Commerce because they work in opportunity zones um, to help storefront businesses and things of that nature. So there are a lot of ecosystems, but what I would echo that Kim stated is that your arsenal needs to be stacked. You want your arsenal to be full before you need it. You don't want to wait until you need a resource to tap into it. You want it to already be on tap for you when you need it. So there are organizations like AARP and other organizations like Amazon, Google, Facebook, all of them have, guess what, small business programs and specifically black and brown programs. Um, so we want to tap into those uh, organizations. And if you're in a specific industry, I would say, Felicia, there are specific ones. There are, there are Black women in technology. There are Black women in construction. I mean, there's so many organizations out there. You just got to get your right mix, stack your arsenal. So when the chips are down, if you're going down, you're going to go down fighting because you have a, 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 a whole army behind you to support you. And how would you rate those, uh, Tawanda? How would I rate them? Yeah. Oh, I think that standalone, they are awesome. But we need more than just standalone. We need them to all connect the pieces and connect the dots for minority and women businesses and black and brown businesses. Meet them where they are, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, and help them connect the dots. Because it's easy to fish in a pond, but when we want them to play in the ocean, so we got to help them navigate into that ocean and be able to play well and thrive. Right. And so, Jan E., before I go to our closing um, uh, question, how would you how would you rate them in these ecosystems designed to support our small businesses? You know, like I said before, um, as you can probably tell Felicia, we all are owners, right? Because we are entrepreneurs. We don't take the victim mentality. We don't go and say, oh my God, you know, get, and we're entitled to all this stuff. No, we're not, right? We live in this wonderful country of United States of America. And I'll tell you, it is fabulous, it's awesome. And as a woman, a minority woman, I can actually own businesses. That's amazing, right? So what I would just leave it is that the resources out there and that we need to, if you don't know the answers, go find somebody else, use us, right, as a resource. So all 500 of you that were on it before, some have dropped, right? I mean, applaud yourself, congratulate yourself for taking the time to learn about the resources that are out there. But um, for those who haven't joined in, because I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs actually working right now, right? So hopefully they will tune in, they will rewatch this, you know, during midnight after the hours and, and, and pick something good out of it. So, but I would say Felicia, information's out there. I'm blessed and I think we're all blessed here, but, um, you know what? Uh, it's 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 a good thing. Good, good, <laughs> That's good, what good. I want to say. Great, great. So you know, as we close, um, I I'm gonna ask all of you to really think about. Um, so you, we know that um, um, following our conversation, we're gonna be talking to um, uh, advocates, policymakers, individuals who are really working on behalf of small businesses to really uh, ensure that they strive and uh, and thrive. And so what do you, from your perspective, think that policymakers and those um, in, um, working on behalf or, or making policies on behalf of small businesses, what is it that you think that they don't get? Because uh, we, we, we talked about the onus of the small business owner, but we know that there are systems in place that are really, um, that are needed to help um, gird up the success of, of small businesses. So um, what is it? that they need to know that you haven't conveyed here in our uh, uh, time today. And we'll start with you, Jenny. Sure, I think, part, you know what, S speak up, right? Because I know right now there's a lot of AAPI hate crimes out there right now. I know our Asian American Pacific Islanders, when you normally very quiet, don't say anything, but speak up, right? Participate in roundtables, participate in media, you know, 
but bring solutions. That's what I say. Don't just whine, but come up with solutions and participate in conversations. And Felicia, I'm personally involved. You know, I'm you know, talking to my SBA folks all the time saying, hey, did you know you could do this better? You know, or, or let me help you, you know? So I think SA, I am holding myself accountable to speak up. So I encourage all our, you know, brothers and sisters, minorities to speak up. Uh, Kim, what do you think that uh, policymakers and advocates um, need to understand about uh, small businesses? Well, one, I say, take a survey, <laughs> come talk to us, ask us, give us incentives to participate because walking away from our businesses, for us, it's a 24 seven. I tell people, it does not stop if I'm on vacation, I'm still connected. Um, at the end of the day, ask us, what are the needs of the small business? Where are the gaps? What's working? What's what not working? How can we enhance what we're doing? It, it's just simple if, of us asking each other, they need to ask us. Perfect. Hi, man. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we have to educate them on mm -hmm. what we do and mm -hmm. take the time, like Jane said, we have to go to meetings and, and, and get involved. And, and uh, I'll give you a quick example. 30 years ago, if I spoke to somebody about life insurance from my country, they almost shoot me. Now, 30 years later, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying I hear it myself, but yes, the fact that you mentioned it was the need why do they need it? And then they can ask us, why do, what do we need? Mm -hmm. And how do we need it? Because what I understand is most businesses is the motor of this country. So I think they should invest a little bit of time and effort. And to Wanda, what, what say you? <laughs> I would state that first and foremost, policymakers, we need to deal with the underlying issue that will continue to follow us until we address it. And that is that we have a discriminatory economic system that needs to be more inclusive. In fact, our culture from a country needs to be more inclusive. So let me just say that enabling policies without enabling resources lead to empty coffers for small businesses, particularly black and brown businesses. And creating policies and vacuums and silos that are not connected where you're not going to the people who are living this every day and getting their ideas, you are missing the mark. This opportunity right now is giving us the time to get on track, to reset, restart, and reinvigorate small businesses, particularly minority women businesses in our country, which we are built upon. Great. Woo. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed this panel as much as I have. I hope you all have learned something from those who are engaged each and every day as I have. And so I just want to uh, thank you. Um, when I reached out to each of you to thank, to ask you to be on this panel, you, you didn't hesitate. So I thank you for all your insight um, today. And I uh, greatly enjoyed hearing what it's like on the ground and really hearing um, from where you sit, what else needs to happen and where those shifts need to be made. Um, so, and I know that the, uh, the other business owners who are with us today, can absolutely relate. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And so now I'm going to uh, hand this off back to Rhett, who is gonna tee us up for our next panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia. And I wanna thank you all as well, because one of the things you said that was really important in that panel was a lot of people can't be here with us today because they're running their businesses. Um, we're obviously thrilled to have hundreds of folks on the line today, but I know each of you took time away from your businesses to be with us and we are grateful for sure.